Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are here uh, with our first edition of Science Saturdays. I'm your host, Dr. Julie Forrester, and I'm here with guest speakers, Dr. Philip Hopley and Professor Ian Crawford, coming to you live this morning from Birkbeck's School of Science. But before I tell you about today's topic, I want to tell you about Science Saturdays. Science Saturdays is a series of free short talks aimed at sharing fabulously cool research with the public. We're in collaboration with the Me Human Project and the National Saturday Club. We're gonna be here every Saturday morning throughout the month of May, covering a new topic with two new scientists each week. And our topics are gonna to range from evolution to development and from mental well-being to psychiatric conditions. So that's five Saturdays in May, meaning 10 short talks that we hope you won't wanna miss. And more importantly, you can join the discussion too. So just type your questions into the chat bar from the discussion panel uh, for the discussion panel that's going to follow these two wonderful talks. And uh, my fabulous assistant, Dr. Georgina Donati, um, is going to be collating your questions um, and posing them to us at the panel session. So what's different about Science Saturdays is that we're not just interested in the science. We also want to know how these scientists found their way into their current positions and how also creativity might play a role in their research. So while you might think of scientists as people who have a knack for numbers and a keenness for detail, you might not have guessed that doing good science can also require a good level of creative artistry. And also, while you might think that you need to know exactly what you wanna be when you grow up from an early age to become a scientist, many of us researchers like myself didn't even know our jobs existed when we were students. So join us every Saturday morning in May. Um, you might be having a nice long lie-in, out on a morning stroll, um, listen over a cup of coffee. Maybe you're with the neighbors or the kids. This is the weird and wonderful world of science that everybody can enjoy. And today our topic is life on earth and beyond. So as I said, I'm joined by Dr. Philip Hopley and Professor Ian Crawford, who are both based at Birkbeck in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And they're go both going to be talking on the planetary scale. So I've, I've got my planet here. We're going to be talking about Earth, but we're also going to be talking about beyond Earth and um, intelligent life in the universe. So I even got my space buns in today on theme. Um, we're going to hear from, uh, from Phil first, and he's going to be speaking on human evolution and climate change. And then we're going to hear from um, Ian, who's going to be speaking to us about the search for intelligent life in the universe. So I'm going to start with Phil. I'm going to ask you to share your screen, and we're really excited to, to hear about um, human evolution and climate change. Okay, thanks, Julie. Feel free to tell us, uh, yeah, a little so, bit more about what you do and who I you are. We'll share my screen. And I'm gonna turn my video off so that you've got the full field. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yep, we're good to go. Great, um, hi everyone. So. Um, in this theme of uh, life on Earth and beyond, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, life on Earth and in particularly um, how uh, life and evolution interacts with uh, planetary scale phenomena. So basically climate change, um, but it's, you know, not, not necessarily climate change as we know it, you know, longer time scales. Um, so we... Basically, I'm going to be looking at climate change and how it's impacted um, human evolution, how we think that our own species is a, is a product of um, natural climate change. So when we, when we think of climate change, we um, tend to have this uh, view. I will see if I can grab my pointer, uh, laser pointer. So we have this view here of anthropogenic climate change, meaning uh, man-made or human-made. Uh, we have these uh, emissions, uh, primarily of carbon dioxide, that uh, result in uh, a warmer climate. So anthropogenic climate change is, is very rapid. It happens over a period of de decades. It's global in extent. 
and we, you know, we are rightly concerned about the, the impacts that will come from this. So we have uh, the threat of extinctions, ocean acidification, extreme weather, et cetera. So this is um, understandably quite a, a sort of a negative uh, view of, of climate change. Um, however, climate change has been occurring on the Earth for, for billions of years, um, and, and most of this has been without the, the uh, impact from, from humans. So um, what we could call natural climate change uh, is, a, is a broader uh, process. It, it involves a whole range of different timescales. So we have um, climate change occurring at the tectonic scale over millions of years. We have orbital scale climate change, which takes thousands of years to occur. We have changes in the sun, the amount of sunlight re reaching the Earth. And of course, we have these changes in, in carbon dioxide as well that are all occurring. Um, through time, changing through time. So natural climate change um, is, uh, on the whole, more gradual than anthropogenic. It takes thousands of years for these changes to accumulate. Um, it can be local or global in extent. And, and like, like the current global warming, it, it can lead to um, species extinctions. However, because the climate change is occurring more slowly, uh, it can also lead to some creative evolutionary changes. So we can see uh, animals and plants adapting to the new environment. Uh, and even this can lead to new species, uh, process we call speciation. But in fact, most of the animals and the plants that we see today, they are being created by this uh, interplay with climate change. Um, and of course, we, we see all these changes in terms of ocean and vegetation. Um, so what I'm going to talk about really is, is the climate changes that are the, the backdrop to our evolution, uh, the evolution of hominins, uh, which occurred about, uh, started around about 7 million years ago. So to, to understand the, the climate changes that we experience in our, in our evolutionary history, we actually have to go a little bit further back. We have to look at the context of the, the environmental changes. And somewhat surprisingly, we have to go back um, really uh, to the time of the dinosaurs, um, 66 million years ago is when the, uh, the non-avian, you know, the dinosaurs that weren't birds went extinct. Um, and it, when you think about, when you see um, the constructions of dinosaurs, you often see them in these warm, swampy uh, environments. So we, we know that the, uh, at that time, we had a very warm earth. It's often referred to as a, a greenhouse earth. Um, but by the time we get to human evolution, we often see pictures with you know, ice ages and, and cold climates. And so we, we transition into what's called an ice house state. So the Earth undergoes this very dramatic change in terms of its, its temperature from this greenhouse to the ice house. Um, and this is exemplified really by the uh, diagram at the bottom here, where this is um, uh, a map of um, ice in Antarctica. And we can see that early on, Around about 50 million years ago, we have virtually no ice in Antarctica. But by the time we get to 30 million years ago, we have an almost full ice sheet on Antarctica. So we, we really do change from an ice-free world to a, a world that is much colder. So why did this happen? Well, what we, the, uh, the main uh, suggestion, what we think there's uh, compelling evidence to, to suggest is that um, there was a large um, mountain building event. So we know that India and Asia collided. When this happened around about 50 million years ago, the Himalayan mountains were uplifted. And this is a, a huge uh, event on, on the planetary scale. And, and what it does is it uh, increases the amount of, of weathering. There's all this steep hills, lots of fresh rock available to be eroded and transported. Um, and this uh, weathering is a chemical reaction, and that chemical reaction takes CO2 out of the atmosphere, and eventually it ends up being uh, buried or sequestered in the ocean. So what we see is a whole series of events. We see the mountain lifting, we see an increase in weathering, we see atmospheric carbon dioxide fall down and reduce, and we see in response to that, we see the glaciation of Antarctica. So this is what we think caused this transition from the greenhouse to ice house. 
Um, but did this have any effect on Africa? Well, again, perhaps surprisingly, it did have a big effect in Africa. So because we see the, the main impact here is that there's a global reduction in carbon dioxide around about 40 million to 20 million years ago. And this was a problem for the plants in Africa. So during the, the greenhouse phase, um, much of Africa was wooded, there were forests, there were primates living in those trees eating fruit. Um, but by the time we get to the ice house, this, uh, this woodland environment is being broken up and replaced by a savanna. So savanna environment is actually um, the youngest environment or biome on Earth. And it only really evolved perhaps around about 8 million years ago. Um, and for it to evolve, it was based around these new types of grasses known as savanna or C4 grasses. And interestingly, these have a whole different way of photosynthesizing compared to other types of plants. And they photosynthesize differently um, because they are living in this low CO2 world and they have to try and concentrate all that CO2 in their leaves in order to grow. So we, we understand the evolution of, of savanna grasses in, in this way. And also, which we'll come back to later, it means that we have a, a signal in terms of the chemistry of these leaves that we can trace um, in called carbon isotopes. So we can look at the isotopic composition of grasses and, um, and understand uh, the environment that way. So we have these um, large scale climate changes um, from, you know, from the ice house to, sorry, from the greenhouse to the ice house. But we also have much more rapid climate changes going on at the orbital time scale. So this is due to um, wobbles in the Earth's climate. These are sometimes called Milankovitch cycles. Uh, and I've got two of them here drawn in this uh, diagram. So Basically, the, the wobble in the Earth's tilt, this happens uh, approximately every 40,000 years, and it particularly impacts the amount of ice that we have in the polar regions. And then we have precession, which is a different type of wobble that takes 23,000 years to occur. And this really impacts um, rainfall in tropical environments. So what we see is if we look at how the rainfall of Africa changes, we see that we have a very strong 23,000 year cycle. And within this rainfall cycle, we see the vegetation changing from this dark green, which is woodland, to the, um, to the yellow, which is uh, the savanna grasses. So we see the, the change from savanna to woodland fluctuating as the Earth's wobble fluctuates in quite a predictable manner. And in conjunction with the vegetation changes, we also see changes in lake levels. So East Africa has these very large uh, lakes today, um, but only you know 10,000 years ago, those lakes were completely um, dried up. And sometimes they were so full that they, they formed one giant lake. So what we, what we see is that on these periods of, of thousands of years, we have um, a very dynamic environment in Africa, a very changeable, um, and it's in this uh, changeable environment that the early hominins, uh, our ancestors, are, are living and evolving. So what are the, the, the hominins? These are our um, extinct relatives. So if we look at this, uh, this simple evolutionary tree here, like living today, we know we have us, the, the anatomically modern humans. Um, and we have chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas, and they are our closest living relatives. Uh, but when we look at the fossil record, we see that uh, since we split from uh, chimpanzees, uh, perhaps about six or seven million years ago, there were a number of uh, fossil species, maybe up to 20 different ones, and these are called the hominins. And what they all share is um, the, an adaptation towards bipedalism. Bipedalism is upright walking. Um, so we see that that's the first thing that, that occurs before brain sizes get larger. We see um, this upright walking. Uh, and it's quite a good suggestion to, to think that this is probably uh, due to the savanna environment. When, when there's more grass, less trees, you have to, to, to walk 
at longer distances uh, between resources. Um, so we see bipedalism occurring first, then we see um, increased tool use. This happens around about 3.3 million years ago. We see the first evidence for tools. Um, an increasing brain size, particularly um, with our own genus, Homo, uh, around about 2 million years ago. And then very later on in, 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 uh, in human evolution, we see the development of cultural traits, language and art. So if we look at these um, early hominins in Africa, so most of um, all of these events occurring within Africa, it's only quite late on in human evolution um, that hominids make their way out of the African continent. Um, and there are lots of different uh, family trees or evolutionary trees that uh, people produce. Um, and I've got just one here. Um, the numbers represent our sort of confidence out of 100 um, in, in these relationships. Um, and Although there's lots of uh, Latin names, the hominins can be sort of uh, grouped really into three different types of hominins. So we have the gracile Australopithecines. Um, so these are some of the first hominins. Um, this, is, this is actually the first hominin found in Africa known as the tongue child. Um, this is a, a locality I uh, work quite a lot on over the years in terms of reconstructing its environment. Um, so this is a, a child, a juvenile, but it has a um, it has a small brain. Um, then we have here; these are the uh, early Homo. You can see it has a much larger brain. Um, and the robust Australopithecines, sometimes called Paranthropus, meaning like a side branch to to the rest of hominins, um, and they have a very different uh, morphology or shape. You can see that um, they have a very uh, large teeth, uh, thick jaw. They have a sagittal crest on the top of the skull here, like one gorillas do. And all of this seems to suggest that there's something about their dietary adaptation, something about the way they eat um, that makes them different to the other hominins. And you can see that the three robust species here seem to be uh, on this side branch of evolution. So basically, there's, we only have one hominin left today, us, but in the past, you know, there were 20 or so. Why were there so many species? And also, what made them different to each other? If you have closely related species living in an environment, there must be something that helps them to be differentiated. They have a niche, basically. You know, so maybe it's something about the diet that enables them to exploit different resources. So to understand this, we need to look at the ecology of um, early hominins that we know they were living in a savanna environment, but what else were they living with? How did they interact with all the other animals and plants? So we have this picture here. This is the savanna environment. We have the C3 trees and the C4 plants that photosynthesize differently. Um, and within this environment, um, that's fluctuating through time, we also see uh, we have carnivores, uh, quite a lot of um, carnivores. Here's a uh, saber-toothed cat. Actually, this species has quite small saber tooth. Um, we have grazers. These are animals that are eating mainly grass. We have browsers. This is an extinct giraffe uh, that's uh, yeah, browsing on, on the leaves high up in the, in the canopy. We have some mega herbivores that were very large. Um, but potential prey species for carnivores. Um, so we understand the, the ecology of most of these. It's quite obvious whether you're a grazer or a browser or carnivore. Um, but how did the early hominids fit in with this ecosystem? So were they, were they herbivores? Were they carnivores? Uh, were they generalists? Yeah, were they able to extract nutrients from a whole range of, of different sources? Um, so this is a, a, an important question. Uh, to be able to ask. But to understand this, we, we need to find tools that can tell us exactly what hominins uh, were eating. And we there are surprisingly ingenious ways that we can look at the diet of extinct animals like hominins. And there's been a lot of work on this over the years. Um, so for, for a group of like hominins that are so obviously different to, to us today, um, we have a lot of questions as to what they might have eaten. 
uh, did they eat meat? And if they did, were they hunting, actively hunting meat? Or were they scavenging like a modern day hyena? Were they you know, taking the scraps after carnivores had, had eaten most of the, the carcass? Um, were they eating fruits and leaves like the modern day chimpanzees? Um, perhaps they were eating invertebrates such as termites or roots and tubers, things equivalent to modern day potatoes, where you can get nice uh, carbohydrates and starch from them. So if we want to answer some of these questions, we have a set of tools that we can use. Um, quite a lot of information comes from uh, the chemistry of, of fossil teeth. So we can take a fossil hominid tooth, we can look at it in the, in the lab using a big machine called a mass spectrometer. And what we can do is we can look at the, the different isotopes of, of carbon. So this is um, atoms of carbon that are heavier and lighter. So carbon-12, carbon-13. And if we look at the ratio of these atoms, um, it can tell us whether the animal itself was eating savanna grasses with their own type of photosynthesis or the uh, trees that have a different type of photosynthesis. So in effect, the carbon isotope value, the higher the values on this graph, grass, the more uh, savanna grasses they were eating. And these light numbers here, low numbers, indicate that they were eating sources uh, from trees and uh, fruit, etc. What we see when we look at the different hominid species, we can see that they are partitioned or they are different based on what they're eating. So we have a species here like Ardipithecus that had a purely C3 diet, meaning it was probably eating leaves and fruit. Um, we have these species here like Australopithecus and Paranthropus that were eating a very broad range. So perhaps they were generalists, they were eating a range of different sources of food. And then Paranthropus, this one with the large sagittal crest and the big teeth. It came as quite a surprise when people did this analysis, but you can see there's a number of different individuals here, maybe 20 that have been analyzed, and it's a strong signal um, that they were eating um, uh, some kind of, of grass, which seems very strange because you can't get enough nutrients for, for you know, a relatively large brain uh, just from eating grass. Um, but with further investigation, we think we understand what's going on with the species. Um, we can look at the, um, the microscopic scratches and damage on, on their teeth. This is what we have here. This is called dental microware. And these scratches confirm this grass-like um, diet. And what we think they were doing, something like what this modern-day bonobo is doing here, where they were wading into the big lakes in East Africa, and they were um, chewing on the roots and tubers of plants like papyrus. And that's how they were extracting all their, their energy for their life. So they were specialized in this, in this lake um, diet. Um, for, for these generalists like Paranthropus robustus, we can see that they were probably eating termites. Um, and we can see that from some of the um, tools. These are bone tools that have been shaped by the abrasion that occurs when you jab uh, a bone into a termite nest to extract the termites. So we have quite really interesting uh, insights into the daily lives of, of some of these hominins. So just to um, finish up, so we, we've talked about in, in quite a lot of detail the environment that early hominins were living at, how really they were being shaped by the, the climate and the environment that they were living in. Um, but just to, to sort of jump forward uh, quite substantially, uh, we can see that our, the, the human uh, relationship with the environment has gone through a few different phases. So what we were talking about was where climate was uh, dominating us and, and producing uh, our adaptations. Uh, and this continued really all the way till um, uh, the end of the last ice age. So maybe uh, 20,000 years or so ago. So what we see is um, our own species, Homo sapiens, that evolved um, about 300,000 years ago. And we had these large glacial interglacial cycles, and this uh, affected the way that humans uh, migrated. Um, you know, we had to use fire to keep warm, all those sorts of things. Um, but what happens is by about 10,000 years ago, um, we, we see that uh, humans have uh, left Africa and are pretty much global in their extent. 
And in this larger population, they are uh, cutting down uh, trees, deforestation uh, and farming. And this is leading to the release of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So the, the first uh, global warming effects start to occur about 10,000 years ago. Um, this is quite gradual. Um, and humans are not aware of the implications of their actions. So they're beginning to dominate and affect the climate, but they aren't aware of it. And then, of course, the Industrial Revolution, uh, we really accelerate our impact on the climate. And it's only in the last generation or two um, that we have realised that our actions are impacting global climate. So hopefully that's um, given you a, a, some some things to think about, about how um, climate and humans interact over long timescales. Um, and particularly giving you some something to think about about um, our evolutionary answers. Thank you so much, Phil. That's super interesting. Um, and I think probably our general understanding of climate change always has a really negative connotation. So um, before we ask you some questions and, and put it to our, our viewers for any questions, um, I wanna just ask you a little bit about how you got to do what you are actually doing today, because obviously it uh, requires a lot of technical knowledge um, and it sounds you know very sciencey, um, but is, did you always wanna be a scientist? Um. No, no, I didn't. Uh, I think I started off um, as a as a geologist. I, you know, I liked. I, I didn't really want to be um, sat at a desk all day. And I thought, oh, I like being out in you know in the countryside on hikes and things. And I thought, well, you know, geology is good. You know, lots of field trips. So I, that's how I started. Um, and then I got into paleontology. So I quite liked you know dinosaurs that kind of thing. Um, but I found myself um, through the PhD that I um, I got awarded. Um, it was in an, uh, an anthropology department. So I've been skirting around in this, this very interdisciplinary field, really, between geology, anthropology, um, geography. Um, so it's very interesting because you get to work with lots of people who have different backgrounds. Um, and uh, it, it's nice to be able to try and mesh everyone's uh, understanding experience to try and solve some of these problems. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting point to make because I, I think the general perception when you're going through school, particularly school in, in the UK, where there's very much a defined stream of subjects that you um, that you do, and then you narrow that significantly from 16 to 18. And it feels like if you want to do something quite quite specific, uh, mm. like what you're doing now, it seems like you kind of have to know that very early on and choose your subjects carefully and make sure that you you make all of these decisions early when, you know, most of us don't really know what we want to do, but it's really nice to hear mm. that there were other routes into those professions without yeah. having to know. Yeah, there, there, are, there are whole subjects that you don't even really touch on at, at school. So human evolution doesn't really get um, taught in, in UK schools. Um, you know, some, some physical geography was what we did at school, but of course geology uh, is a subject that doesn't really get taught at A-levels. Um, so yeah, there are whole branches of science that, um, that you can discover at the university level. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I think that's a really nice... Um, kind of positive thing to communicate that, that don't stress if you don't know what you want to do um, when you're 16 or even 18 or even 20, choose, choose subjects that you're passionate about um, and through exploring and, and your, your kind of time at, in higher education, you will happen upon things that um, interest you and you can navigate your path from there. So you don't have to have it um, preset, which I think is really nice. Okay, so we have time for just uh, one or two questions then before we move on to our next talk. And, and here's a question that's come from one of our viewers. Um, uh, so is the climate movement really more about saving humans and the animals that we feel nostalgic about rather than saving the planet, which we uh, will always be able to adapt? Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, the planet itself will will keep spinning and will will be fine. 
Um, but it's it's humans and our, really it's our um, social structures. You know, we're, we're not built for climate um, mitigation. You know, we're, we're um, you know, cities, if sea level rises, you know, we're not adaptable enough to, to deal with some of those things. So there are going to be a lot of social implications um, of, of climate change. And I think that's perhaps the that's the biggest worry in the social injustice in, of different countries. And, and uh, you know, the poorer people are going to be the most affected by global climate change. So I think there's a lot of human and social issues, um, but the planet itself um, will should be fine. We'll be fine. Well, no, I mean, yeah, of course, all the species, all the extinctions are a, a huge thing to worry about as well. Fingers crossed, you know, we'll be able to um, that limited. Yeah, well, you gave us a lot to think about. So if there's anybody who's listening um, who wants to ask a question to Phil, we will have time for additional questions um, after both of the talks. So do put them into the, the chat bar and we will pick those up and pose those to our speakers um, after we hear from Professor Ian Crawford. Uh, so thank you so much, Phil, but you're going to stick around with us um, and we're going to move on uh, to, uh, to Professor Ian Crawford. Ian, you are going to tell us about the search for intelligent life uh, beyond Earth, so in the universe, um, and we're very excited to hear your talk too. So are you happy to kick off and share your screen? Yeah, thank, thanks, Julie. Yes, I am. Let's see if I can just uh, get this to work. Um, great. Can you, can you see good. the screen? It's Excellent. All good. Right. Okay, brilliant. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, and um, uh, thanks to Phil for that uh, excellent introduction on, on human human evolution. I want to talk about whether there, there are other, any other places in the universe where um, uh, intelligent life might have, might have evolved. So I'm going to start with this beautiful picture. This shows the Earth. It was taken by the Apollo 11 spacecraft uh, halfway to the moon in 1969. Um, you've got to be quite a long way away from the Earth to see the, the Earth as a whole planet floating in space like this. Um, but I particularly like this picture because you see here the continent of Africa. So this is where human evolution occurred. Um, and like the, the evolution of savannas and the hominins that, that Phil was telling us about all, all, all happened all happened down here from three million years ago um, onwards. And then uh, here we are after three million years, we built a spaceship going to the moon and we can look back at our, at our own planet. Now, this is as far as we know, this is the, I mean, as far as we know, this is the only planet on which life has evolved. And it's, and it's certainly the only planet on which uh, intelligent life has evolved that we know of. So the, the question is, and this is the whole um, subject area of this new interdisciplinary science of astrobiology, is we want to know whether this has happened anywhere else. I mean, are we, is this planet really unique in the universe in having evolved life and intelligence, or are there other, are there other places like it? So that's what we want to... Um, that's what we want to try and find out. Now, of course, we can start uh, by exploring our own neighborhood, our own solar system. And we're doing quite a lot of work looking at our neighboring planets to see whether they were once habitable or even whether they might still be inhabited in some, in some way. Um, so I, you probably recognize this picture. This is a recent picture from the Perseverance rover that landed on Mars just last February. Um, not, it looks a very barren, barren landscape, and, and, and of course it is, but um, Perseverance landed, deliberately targeted to land in a crater that was once a crater lake. So just like Africa has these big lakes, billions of years ago, but it was billions of years ago, three, three, three and a three and a half thousand million years ago, there were craters on Mars that were also full of water and the Jezero crater, which is where Perseverance has landed, was once such a crater lake. So billions of years ago, this barren landscape was full of water and, and therefore seems to our way of thinking, a, a relatively habitable environment. And what we want to know is whether life ever evolved in that environment. And even if it, you know, it might well now be extinct, but perhaps we could still find evidence. And that's driving a lot of our exploration efforts of Mars and other, other places in our own solar system. But of course, all we're looking for here is evidence for microbial life. 
certainly there's no intelligent life on Mars and there's no intelligent life anywhere in our solar system or we would know about it by, by now. So we're surveying our solar system in the search for um, microbial life. We haven't found any yet either. So we, we don't know there's ever been any life on Mars. That's why we're looking. Um, um, and we're also exploring the outer solar system, especially the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn, which are thought to have oceans of liquid water underneath their icy surfaces. They also might be habitable environments. But again, if, if they are inhabited, they're only likely to be inhabited by microorganisms. And there's no, no sign that even if life occurred anywhere else in our solar system, it's ever evolved uh, to, um, well, even to, to an animal, multicellular animal stage of evolution, never mind intelligence. So if we're going to search for intelligent life in the universe, we're going to have to look beyond our own solar system. So the good news here is there are an awful lot of stars. Um, this picture shows a region of the Milky Way in the, um, this is in the southern, southern sky. I hope you can see the laser pointer. This is the constellation of the Southern Cross here. Um, these two stars here are, are Alpha and Beta Centauri. So this star here is actually the closest star to the sun, Alpha Centauri, four, four light years away. But then if you look into the background, there are these millions of little dots, right? And each of these little dots is a star. So there are millions and millions of stars in this image. And of course, our Milky Way galaxy has something like 100,000 million stars in it. Now, one of the most um, exciting developments in modern astronomy in the last 20 years is our discovery that actually planets are really common around stars. Um, we've discovered since 1995 about 4,000, well, over 4,000 planets orbiting other stars now. Uh, but and although 4,000 is a small fraction of the total number of stars in the sky, we can do the statistics. We can say that we found 4,000 stars out of um, out of how, out of however 4,000 planets out of how, out of the number of stars that we've searched because we've only searched a handful of relative small number of stars for planets. And the point is, planets are almost always detected around stars. So we can now say that planets form as a natural process byproduct of the formation of stars. And therefore, every star probably has a planetary system. Every one of these dots, I mean, it's going to be quite exceptional to find a star that doesn't have a planetary system. The vast majority of all of these billions of stars are going to have planetary systems. So that's very, um, that's very optimistic if we think that um, if we think that plant life needs planets to evolve upon, then um, there are going to be plenty of places where life could evolve. And since there are so many of them, it seems quite reasonable to think that maybe on some of these planets life has not only originated but evolved through natural selection along along lines not necessarily the same as that happened on our planet but in a similar direction towards increasing complexity and eventually the evolution of intelligent life so that's what we want to know the extent to which that has been going on in our universe um, now uh, i just want to give you a quick insight into how we've discovered these these planets um, there are various ways of detecting planets around other stars, but it's quite important to understand from the outset that we can't really see any of them. All of these planets are tiny um, and they're very close to very bright stars. And so almost all of our means of uh, detecting planets around other stars rely on indirect means that sense changes to the star because we can at least see the star changes to the star induced by planets from which we can infer the presence of planets. And one of the ways of doing this is to look out for a thing, this is an artist's impression of course, but the artist here has drawn a little planet, little black dot, and it's been, and from, from our perspective, it's moving across the front of its star. So that's like it's eclipsing a little bit of its star. So whenever that happens, the star's gonna get a little bit fainter because there's a planet in the way. And so a very successful spacecraft, American NASA spacecraft, the Kepler Space Telescope, which operated for nine years, starting in 2009, surveyed hundreds of thousands of stars looking for these transits of uh, planets, and it's discovered uh, over 2,000. So over 2,000 of the 4,000 exoplanets we've now detected were made by this single space telescope. Um, 
Um, and so this is one way we can detect planets and it's how we know that planets are really common. Now the inset here shows an artist drawing. Bear in mind we can never see views like this, not yet with any of our instruments. So this is an artist drawing, um, but it's an artist drawing of one of these Kepler stars Kepler-1649, uh, which is orbited by a planetary system. And this planet here, which is an artist drawing, Kepler-1649c, is one of the most, possibly one of the most Earth-like planets yet detected around another star. It's a little bit bigger than the Earth, and, and it lies within the star's so-called habitable zone, which is the distance from a star in which liquid water would be stable as a liquid on a planet's surface provided the planet has an atmosphere uh, that contains uh, uh, water vapor and carbon dioxide. Um, now we don't actually know whether Kepler-1649c even has an atmosphere, so we know it's an Earth-sized planet. We don't know yet that it's an Earth-like planet, but many such planets are being discovered and they of course lend themselves to follow-up observations by the next generation of large space telescopes, which may tell us a bit more. So our next uh, opportunity to determine whether planets like Kepler-16549c are actually like the Earth with atmospheres and liquid water and therefore be habitable uh, will come from our next generation of large space telescopes, much bigger than the Kepler telescope, much bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and our next, our next um, opportunity will be this telescope. It's an artist drawing, obviously, of the James Webb Space Telescope which will get launched hopefully the end of this year. It's well over its time scale, it's well over its budget, but it is finally due to be launched at the end of this year. Uh, it'll be a six, six and a half meter diameter telescope uh, flying in space. This funny thing it's sitting on is a, um, a sun shield to keep the sun off the telescope mirror and out of the optics. Um, uh, and the James Webb Space Telescope will be, um, James Webb, by the way, you probably haven't heard of him, but he was the NASA administrator during the Apollo program and probably has as much, almost as much claim to getting humans to the moon 50 years ago as John F. Kennedy. Um, anyway, he's got this telescope named after him, James Webb Space Telescope, and, and it will be a sufficiently large telescope to um, not fully resolve planets around other stars. It's never gonna give us a, um, it's never gonna give us an actual image like this, but it will be capable of analyzing the atmospheric composition of planets like this to see whether water and carbon dioxide are present. And so we could make some judgment as to whether the planets are habitable or not. Um, but of course, detecting a habitable planet um, doesn't tell us that life is necessarily present. Again, instruments like the James Webb Telescope, they may be able, by analyzing the planet's atmosphere, they may be able to tell us whether molecules in the atmosphere things like methane and oxygen, if they were both present, you don't normally expect methane and oxygen to be present in an atmosphere at the same time, unless something's constantly producing the methane because otherwise the oxygen will keep destroying it. So that's, that, that, that was an atmosphere like that would be said to be out of chemical equilibrium. And the James Webb Space Telescope may be able to detect planetary atmospheres out of equilibrium. And that may be an indicator that life is present. Um, but of course, it doesn't tell us whether intelligent life is present, which is why it just tells us that life is present. So it's a start. Um, but what I've said I'd talk about in this, in this, uh, in this talk is whether, um, whether it's possible to de determine whether intelligent life is, is present in the universe. So most of, um, most, most, most of this is done by, um, so I've called, I've called this, this is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. So well, a well-known acronym, you've doubtless, doubtless heard of it. Um, most of this work is being done by um, a radio telescopes. So I've called this radio telescope. So I've called this classical SETI because it's um, um, the, way, the way that SETI started as really one of the, the, the first things that radio, that astronomers could think how, if we want to detect intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, um, uh, how are we going to, um, how, what, 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 what possibilities do we have? What, what tools can we use? And some of the tools that we do have at least are radio, radio telescopes. And so we could search the sky looking for artificial radio, sources of artificial radio noise. And this would indicate whether, I mean, if you detect radio waves, artificial radio signals from the sky, then this tells us that life has evolved to the point where some intelligent creature somewhere has been able to build a radio transmitter. So we can at least search for those. 
Um, this shows the Parkes radio telescope in New South Wales in Australia. It's one of the instruments that's used for this kind of work. Um, the first SETI searches were performed in 1960 by the radio astronomer Frank Drake. Um, and so we've now had 60 years of SETI, and it's sad but true that no unambiguous detections have yet been made of extraterrestrial radio signals. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that intelligent life is rare in the universe. I mean, there might be intelligent creatures out there that are intelligent but don't build radio transmitters. And even if there are intelligent creatures out there building radio transmitters, there's still an awful lot of the universe we haven't searched yet. The sky is a very big place. The universe is a very big place. The radio spectrum is a very big place. So there are a lot of frequencies that we haven't been able to search yet. So, so we shouldn't be too worried, perhaps, that we haven't detected any alien radio signals in 60 years. But these searches are gradually deploying bigger and bigger telescopes, much more sophisticated computer software to search the data. Um, and, and eventually, we may in many several decades in the future, and we, if we still haven't detected any radio signals, we may then be able to start to conclude that intelligent life might be, might be rare in the universe. At the moment, all we can do is to keep on looking. Um, you too can get involved in some of this, should you wish to. There is a um, an online um, uh, um, what is the word an online program called SETI at Home which you can Google SETI at home. And SETI at home, if you sign up to SETI at home, um, you will be sent um, large quantities of data, radio data from telescopes such as this for your computer or your laptop to crunch through overnight when you're not using it, because it requires an awful lot of computing power trying to search for signals in all of this radio noise. So by SETI at home, we'll let you download SETI data and you leave it. You leave your computer crunching on it overnight. And who knows? You may you may wake up in the morning, and your your personal computer may have discovered an alien signal in the data it, it's been working on. Um, so no one that hasn't happened to anybody yet. But you know, you never know. The truth the truth is out there. So we've got to keep crunching the data, and eventually someone may find evidence for these alien radio um, signals. Um, so that's the, that's so historically, this is the way SETI has proceeded, searching the sky for alien radio signals. There are a couple of other things that we might do, a bit more slightly, uh, not controversial, but a bit more left field. Um, we might search the sky, searching for evidences of large scale um, alien, the activities of, of extraterrestrial civilizations. I mean, civilizations that are a bit beyond our own stage uh, of technology might be able to start doing things in space on such a scale that we might be able to detect them. Um, so if, if there are intelligent creatures in the, in the universe that engage in large scale engineering, we could look for the products of these. And these are sometimes called techno signatures um, to distinguish them from bio signatures. So if you're looking for methane molecules in the atmosphere of an extraterrestrial planet, that would be a bio signature, uh, a chemical a signature of biology. Um, a techno signature would be looking for sig signatures of alien technology. Um, well, here's an example. This is a very exotic example. Um, in the 1960s, the physicist Freeman Dyson suggested that a really advanced civilization might start uh, building things around its star to capture the starlight. I mean, it's an enormous source of energy goes to waste from a star like the sun radiated out into space. Only a tiny fraction strikes the earth. Um, and of course that tiny fraction keeps us all alive, but most of the sun's energy is radiated in, in all directions into empty space. So an advanced civilization might try to capture some of it and it might start to build structures like this. Uh, and, and Dyson even suggested that an intelligent civilization that wanted to collect all the energy from its star might physically enclose its star, um, obviously at a distance outward, out of, outwards from all of where its planets are, to capture all, all the starlight. And such a thing is called a Dyson sphere. Um, well, searches have been made for large scale space engineering like Dyson spheres, and none have been found yet. Um, it is possible, though, because of the way that um, telescopes like Kepler search for exoplanets as transiting across their um, 
star, if an alien civilization was building a large structure in space around a planet um, around another star, then that too would get in the way of starlight and we might see it as a dip in the brightness of the star from a space telescope such as um, Kepler or, or um, James Webb Space Telescope. Um, Anyway, although I've raised this as an exotic possibility, you have to be aware that there have been some searches. I'm not very comprehensive ones yet, but what searches have been made searching for alien techno signatures have also been negative. We haven't yet found any. Um, finally, one could uh, search for evidence of alien technologies or alien civilizations that have paid us a visit, perhaps in the distant past. Um, I hope you recognize this picture. It's a still from Stanley Kubrick's uh, film, 2001, A Space Odyssey, um, where an alien artifact was discovered on the moon. So the lunar explorers discovered this artifact, they dug it up. Here it is, an alien, uh, famous, the famous monolith. Well, if we were to find an, something like this on the moon or elsewhere in our own solar system, hasn't been made by humans, obviously, then this would be proof that even if alien intelligence is don't exist in the universe today, they did once because they came this way and they've left something behind that we might we might hope to discover. Now, of course, we haven't found any evidence for anything like this uh, yet either, but then we haven't really searched much of our own solar system very thoroughly yet. So although it seems a, it's a long shot, obviously, but in addition to searching the sky with radio telescopes and searching the sky for techno signatures, I do think that as we explore our own solar system, which we are doing, and we will continue to do, in part to look for evidence of microbial life in our own backyard, as we explore our solar system, we should at least keep our eyes open for the possibility of alien artifacts in our own solar system, because who knows, they, they might be there and we might discover them. Um, if you've seen the film, and I do encourage everyone to either read, um, well, you should actually both both see the film 2001 a space odyssey uh, it's an excellent film even though you do have to see it about three times before you understand it um and also the the book arthur c Clarke's book 2001 a space odyssey is well worth reading because it's the plot is slightly different from what's portrayed in the film uh, but both of them however they, they do have something rather unorthodox to say about the role of alien technology in the evolution of of hominins <laughs> so 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 anyway Anyway, there's no, there's no scientific basis for those speculations at all, but, but it's, I'll just mention it in the context of um, the, uh, the discussion today. Um, so I think that brings me to my last, my last slide. Oh no, sorry, there is, I'll, I'll skip over this until there are any questions because this is, uh, this is an equation and I, was, I wasn't sure I was supposed to use equations. But th this picture, this, this, is, this is Frank Drake. Frank Drake, who conducted the first SETI search ever in 1960. And in 1961, he produced an equation, the so-called Drake equation. I won't go through it now, um, where he tried to predict how many intelligent civilizations do we expect to find? I mean, is SETI a waste of time? Do we expect to find any? Should they be common or rare? And he, he found a way to try and quantify this in his equation, which basically takes the number of stars in the galaxy and multiplies them by the fraction on which life evolves, the fraction of this life that involves intelligence, the fraction of this life that builds radio telescopes and spaceships. And we don't know any of these fractions, so we have to guess at the moment, but, but, but we, we are beginning to learn how to put constraints on some of these numbers, which means we could in principle start to solve the Drake equation and get some estimate for how many technological civilizations we might expect in the, in the universe. But I'll leave that to the que questions, should anyone have any questions? So that does bring me to my last um, slide, which is a picture of the Earth again. So this is a picture of the Earth taken from Apollo 8. Spacecraft orbiting the moon in 1968. It was the first time human beings had seen our own planet from the distance of the moon. It looks a lot smaller now because the Apollo 11 picture I showed at the beginning was the Earth halfway, was a, the spacecraft was halfway to the moon. Here's a spacecraft at the moon. The Earth's already got a lot smaller in the sky. Um, uh, this is the North, North, North Pole up here, the South Pole there. You can see this is the continent of Africa. You see this, this orange uh, bit is the Western Sahara. And then here is Namibia down here. So there's the continent of Africa again, West, West Africa. Um, 
I, I just show I just show this um, image to bring back come back to the point I made at the beginning. As far as we know, I mean, until our explorations tell us otherwise, this is the only planet in the universe on which life has evolved, and the only universe where or the only planet on which life has evolved in intelligence. So there may be other Earths out there in the universe, but we don't know, and there may not be. They may actually be quite rare. Um, it's, it's still possible for all we know that the earth is unique in having had this rich history of biological evolution. So this does put a huge responsibility on our shoulders. I mean, we may have just through no fault of our own, just evolved through natural selection, but we've ended up where whether we like it or not, we could be the caretakers for the only inhabited planet in the universe. So obviously we've got a, a huge self-interest, vested self-interest. We need to protect our planet to protect ourselves and our own civilization, of course. But, but, but it, it could be, our responsibility could extend further than that. I mean, for all we know, we could have become the caretakers of the only inhabited planet in the whole universe. The future of life in the universe may depend on what we do on this planet in the next um, couple of centuries. Okay, that seems a good place to stop. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Ian. That was so interesting. I, I'm, I'm a huge Star Trek and Star Wars fan, so I'm hoping that there is life in other planets as well, and, and we'll see evidence of that. So I'm going to download the SETI at home application. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> So while we gather up some questions for you from, from viewers, I'm, I'm going to pose to you um, a similar question that I posed to Phil earlier um, in that, did you always know you wanted to be in this area of research? And like, how did, how did it come about? Yes, I think I've pretty much always known since I was about seven or eight. Um, I was uh, eight in 1969. So the Apollo program was pretty, pretty important while I was growing up. I mean, it was always on the news, people walking on the moon and everything. And I sort of grew up in, in, in a, an environment where this seemed normal, right? I mean, it seemed quite normal that people should be on the moon exploring space. I would say in addition to that, I, I kind of lost my way a little bit in my sort of early teens, sort of went off space for a bit. Uh, but then I had a, an excellent English teacher at my school guy called Mr. Hardman. And one day Mr. Hardman came into class with a big cardboard box and it was full of science fiction books. I mean, they were his books and he would brought them in to share with the class. And uh, so I started reading some of these science fiction books and that suddenly reignited my, uh, my interest that, 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 that yeah, there's a huge universe out there and we could we could be we could be exploring it and and i should just say i i i i i my father also i mean my father was a dentist but he also had a sort of amateur interest in in astronomy so so i think those three things combined uh, got me into it from a very early on, on um from a young age so I, I can't pretend that i haven't really always been interested in space because i i always have been yeah, and I think when you are passionate about something, you will find a route towards that that profession. And, and I always um, tell my students too that if you're passionate about something, follow it up because you will find some way uh, to to study that area. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. That area, and it's so important. Well, for me, it's so important to do something that that I'm actually passionate about. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, so, I, so my headmaster at school, he told me that I'd never get a job in astronomy and I should, you know, I should consider applying to university to do engineering. But I, but I just knew, I mean, engineering is really important, right? We need engineers to build these spaceships and telescopes and things apart from anything else. But I just knew that if I, if I, if I were to do that, I'd just be really, you know, bored. And I, you, you can't study a subject at university that you're going to be bored in. <laughs> you absolutely have to be interested in it, passionate about it to keep the motivation going. So, um, so, I, so I declined his advice and I, I studied <laughs> astronomy at university. I completely agree. And sometimes it also takes just that one role model, it might be a teacher or a parent or a mentor who has a passion for the subject as well, that can just ignite that spark and keep you motivated um, to, to kind of pursue that area. And I, I've also definitely experienced that too. So, so yes, a shout out to all those fantastically passionate teachers out there. 
Um, we've, we've got a few questions for you, uh, Ian, or if you're happy uh, to receive a couple of those now and then yeah, we'll, of course, yeah. we'll go back in and we'll do a little bit of a panel as well. But, but before we start the panel, let me, let me just ask you a couple of questions that have been posed in our chat bar. Um, the first one being, what do you mean by intelligent life? Yeah, so this is a, an excellent question and it's not, it's not well defined. No one really has a definition. Well, we actually, no one has a definition for life either. You could ask me, what do I mean by life? And I'd be stuck. Even the, the biologists have something like a hundred definitions of life and they all have different, they're all plausible, but they all have you study them carefully enough, then they all <laughs> eventually you always find an exception to any of them. And, and, and intelligence is even worse. So absolutely, how do we find it, define intelligence? Because we we can't. I won't go back. I won't go back to my screen. But but perhaps if I have a chance later to pull up the Drake equation, yes, he's got this fraction in there, the fraction of life that becomes intelligent. But he's got no um, no way of defining intelligence. So he does then include another factor in his equation, which he calls the fraction of intelligent life, whatever that is, the fraction of intelligent life that can communicate across interstellar space, because that is something that we can measure, right? We can imagine a lot of intelligent creatures out there. So alien equivalents of dolphins, for example, um, which probably may be, may be high, highly intelligent, but we have no way of interacting with them to judge because we can't possibly get into their minds. Um, so all we can really search for is that subset of intelligent entities, which do something that can be noticed. I, they do something with their intelligence that we can notice, like they start building spaceships or start sending radio signals. Then at least we can detect those. But of course that's, or even, even if we detect some of those, it's always going to be a, whatever, the, whatever we find will be a small fraction, presumably, of creatures out there in the universe which are intelligent in the sense that they have their own minds, they're aware of their own existence, they can possibly play around with abstract concepts. Um, but, but unless they're interacting in their environment in a way that um, changes it from, and can, we can see this change from a great distance, then we'll never know about them. So it's an excellent question, and I, I and I have no answer to the definition of, of what intelligence is. Um, uh, but but I, I do think SETI could can still hope to detect, should they exist, still hope to detect that subset of intelligence that produces a technology, because a technology we might be able to observe. Yeah, and, and I think that very much mirrors, Phil's got his camera off, but, but if he wants to pop back on now, I'm sure that very much mirrors um, are trying to understand ancient humans who no longer inhabit the earth and we have to go by the the artifacts or what's what's left behind to infer about what they might have been thinking or doing or interacting because we have no idea and no way to probe the, the minds of those individuals plus in psychology of course we have no pure definition of what being conscious even means uh, at a biological level. Um, so, so I think we have these problems across the board, um, but, but truly, truly interesting. I don't know, Phil, if you want to comment on that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult uh, question, isn't it? The, um, yeah, what is, what is life, what is intelligence? Um, and also, yeah, uh, for me on, you know, the, on, on Earth, yeah, which is the only case study we have, you know, what are the processes that lead to it? We, we don't have a good handle on how, likelihood. You know, if you, if you could start Earth all over again, um, how often would you end up in intelligence? You know, is it an inevitable uh, or was it extremely chancy? Um, there probably is more work that could be done on, on Earth's evolution to, to try and understand the, the role of of, of balance in, in evolution. Um, we've got a question for uh, Ian from, from um, Megan. Um, if indeed the James Webb telescope discovers habitable atmospheres around planets, is there any way we'd ever know if there is life in any form on it, especially if it isn't intelligent? Yeah, hi Megan. Yes, that's an excellent question. And the answer, the short answer is prob probably not. Um, so I think the first thing is in instruments like James Webb, they might be able to tell us whether a planet has an atmosphere and they might be able to tell us what the main atmospheric constituents are. It's not obvious that 
they'd be able to detect, well, I, I know it's not true. I, it, it is true that even big telescopes like James Webb are not gonna be able to detect molecules that are really scarce in a planet's atmosphere. The kind of molecules that life might produce uh, or methane is a good example. Methane's borderline. You could imagine other molecules that are um, uh, that would be better biosignatures, but they're likely to be incredibly scarce. And if space web in the, that is scarce in the planet's atmosphere, and and space telescopes like James Webb are not big enough or sensitive enough to detect really rare molecules. So that would be a task for the next generation of really big. Um, you see, how do I know this cat isn't intelligent? You see, in some sense, it will be. So, sorry, I just go. Sorry, go. So I see Julian. I don't know whether the viewers can see that this cat. No, but anyway, um, uh, uh, where was I? So, the next generation of really big space telescopes will be more sensitive and so could detect scarcer biosignatures. But the problem is, um, Megan, and you're absolutely right. Um, just because we detect some molecules in a planet's atmosphere, we won't definitely know that 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 definitely means that life is present. And it certainly, you know, says nothing about whether this life is intelligent. If you'd been an alien civilization with a big telescope like James Webb, and you'd taken a spectrum of the earth to, uh, to say, at, at any time in the last 2000 million years, really, since oxygen became abundant in the earth's atmosphere, so you'd have got a similar spectrum. And yet throughout that time, we've had the planets been at times inhabited only by microorganisms. The planet's been inhabited by dinosaurs. The planet's been inhabited by hominins. None of that will make a change to the spectrum that you would observe with a, a telescope across hundreds of light years of empty space. So, so I don't think we can ho really hope to learn that with information with telescopes. I think ultimately we're gonna have to start thinking about building spaceships think that's a, be a huge undertaking to send a spaceship to a planet orbiting another star. But the one thing we've learned about exploring our own solar system, I mean, this is why we have perseverance on Mars, is that you actually have to go to some of these planets to really see what they're like. And I think ultimately the same is going to apply for exoplanets as well. Uh, I mean, I think it's hundreds of years in the future at least 100 before we could build a spaceship that could get <laughs> Alpha Centauri on a sensible time scale. But I think the logic points that way. The space telescopes will come out with a short list of interesting planets. But then if we really want to learn what's going on on these planets, we're probably going to have to bite the bullet and find a way to visit them, I think. All right, well, throwing a question now over to Phil in trying to learn about uh, the kind of life that happened before we uh, emerged as modern humans, we've got a question from Ruby saying, what kind of science processes are used when looking at fossil records to find out more about the environment? For example, when you were talking about looking at the enamel on teeth. Right, yeah, so uh, there's, there's two things there. There's, um, we have um, geolo geological proxies where we can use, um, uh, rocks and um, sediments to tell us about the environment and we also have um, the paleo diet so what the uh, teeth themselves can tell us. Um, so I touched on a little bit of, of, of what the teeth tell us so we have um, chemical methods um, where we can look at oxygen isotopes, carbon isotopes, strontium isotopes and these all tell us um, about the individual so um, as I mentioned in the talk carbon isotopes can tell us about the type of carbon they're consuming and therefore the type of plants or animals they're eating. Um, strontium tells us about um, migration. So it's a, it's a geological proxy, meaning different rocks have different strontium values. So if a hominin lived in one area when it was younger and then it moved to a new geological area, we can, uh, we can identify that migration in terms of its strontium isotope signature than its tooth. So that, that's quite an interesting tool that is being used more and more. Um, but in terms of in terms of our environmental proxies, there's so many and, and they're increasing in terms of their sophistication um, all the time. So we, we can look at lots of things um, like uh, we can look at the waxes of plants that tell us a lot. Um, and we, yeah, I mean, we're understanding a lot about paleo, paleo climate, so the climate of the past. Um, we, we're getting more and more detailed records. So we, we I mentioned uh, climate change on the scale of a few thousand years, but with time we're actually getting down to sort of 
um, decadal uh, resolution. You know, the fact that we can look at something, we can look at even annual uh, climate change millions of years ago, and, it, and it's quite impressive the resolution that we're able to get with, with these new proxies. Cool. Thank you, Phil. Um, I'm going to come back now, now to Ian. We've got a question from Rick asking, one of our planets possesses high flammable gases. Um, any chance of ignition creating a binary star system in our system? Uh, so, um, hi, Rick. Yes, I think the answer is no. I'm, I'm not sure that we, which planet you're referring to. Um, it, it's, it's true that Titan, Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, has a significant amount of methane in its atmosphere, but about 4%. Um, in addition to nitrogen, uh, but of course it can't um, it can't uh, it can't catch fire because there's no oxygen. So you can only have combustion if you have a flammable substance combined with oxygen. Um, but of course, even if you even if you did, it wouldn't be a that wouldn't be a star. I mean, stars don't burn through chemical combustion; they they burn through nuclear fusion uh, reactions in their cores. So the the temperatures and pressures. Um, needed for nuclear fusion to occur um, uh, can only, I mean, that's what a star is really, only in the in centres of stars are the temperatures and pressures sufficient for nuclear fusion reactions to occur. There's no chance of anything in our solar system forming another star. Even, even the planet um, Jupiter is, is about 60 times less, too, too, too low a mass for it to um, uh, temperatures in the center to permit nuclear fusion reactions to occur. So, our, our, I mean, there are plenty of binary star systems in the in the universe, but our solar system isn't one, and it's not going to be one. Uh, with one caveat though, uh, those of you who've read the sequel to 2001, A Space Odyssey 2010, will know that the aliens do uh, take positive steps to turn Jupiter into a star uh, by uh, compressing it. <laughs> And heating it in it. So, 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 having said it's not possible, maybe a really, really advanced technology that's well out of our league might conceivably be able to turn a planet such as Jupiter into a star. Who knows? But it won't happen naturally. Uh, Rick says thank you. Um, and we've got another question um, uh, for you, Ian, from Ruby. Uh, what does our understanding of this research into space? The information coming from the telescopes, uh, etc., contribute to our life on Earth now. Well, I think it. Um, hi, Ruby. Thanks for the question. Yes. So I think it. Um, I think it. What it gives us is uh, the context uh, within which we live. So I'll come back to my this final slide that shows not not a planet, other planets orbiting other stars, but it shows the Earth orbiting it, it, its star. And I think space exploration and astronomy are uniquely placed to provide this perspective so that we can um, truly comprehend our cosmic, uh, um, well, insignificance in a way, but significance in another, right? And I think that, in the, for all we know, we may be the only, may be the only intelligent creatures in the universe uh, occupying one of the very few habitable planets in the universe, for all that we know. Well, well, it's only a science, it's only a space science and astronomy that's going to tell us this. Is the Earth unique or is it not? Uh, and I do think this has implications, social and political implications for the way we govern ourselves on this planet and the way we organize ourselves. Um, so I think that would be my 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 top level answer. It provides perspective on the universe. It tells us our place within the great scheme of things. And, and to my mind, that is the main societal benefit of exploring the universe in addition to the you know the obvious it's interesting scientific questions it sets the whole context of humanity um in a, and we wouldn't have this we wouldn't be aware of this context unless we were exploring the universe well thank you very much ian um i think um I think we, we've tackled most of the questions from, from our viewers, but one of the things that I promised I would ask, and, and it's really interest uh, of mine as well, is um, to kind of demonstrate how science is not just one thing. It's not one specific field, but it's pretty multidisciplinary in most of our areas of research. Uh, I'm myself a evolutionary psychologist like Phil, and I also look at the development of, of cognition, how 
um, how our unique human skills emerged over evolutionary time and also how they emerged through development from infancy to adulthood. Um, but one of the things that struck me, because I never thought of myself as super sciencey when I was a kid, um, is that there, there can be quite a lot of creativity that goes into doing good science. And I just wanted to know if that's something that you found in your own work. Um, and if so, do you maybe have any examples that you might like to share with us? Uh, well, Phil, do you want to go first? Um, okay. Uh, I can't think of any uh, specific examples, but um, I mean, I would say the, the sort of paleo, paleo sciences, so the, the science of the past um, in itself is quite, there is imagination that is required just to ask the questions and, and visualize, you know, what life was like for, for different species and, and different individuals. Um, so it does involve quite a lot of lateral thinking, trying to sort of ask, um, try and see it in, in various ways, pulling in information from, from a whole range of sources um hypothesis building is is quite creative um because well, not only do you have to come up with a hypothesis but you have to be able to uh demonstrate that you can test it um so so there is there is creativity um i mean the nearest thing to uh genuine art within within my field is um paleo paleo art is, is quite a thing where scientists and artists work together to to try and draw um uh, extinct creatures. Uh, we had a few examples on, on my slides, actually. Of, you know, um, I think quite a lot of those are done with, uh, you know, collaborations between the artist and the, ana the anatomist, and they, they try and make sure um, their the, the good reproductions can, can be made. Um, so yeah, I think I think there is um, definitely the there is creativity um, in terms of. Of, of coming up with uh, with ideas and I mean, and even in terms of um, selling your your research, uh, trying to get research grants and proposals, you know you have to uh, make your work um, seem interesting to the people awarding the money. You know you have to you sell it in that sense, and and there is a creativity in in, in making people interested. In yeah, that, that I, I find that so true. You have to build a narrative. It's almost like creative writing. Uh, in, in some ways, and that you, you want to be able to contextualize the work that you do, make it relatable and, and tell a story around it that, that, um, that brings everything together and, and makes sense, not, not just to us who are working in the field and might know the minute detail, but to be able to present that to non-specialists and the public. Um, I think also requires a great a great deal of, of creativity. I've, I've really enjoyed that side of research. Um, what about you, Ian? Yeah, well, I agree with all of that. I mean, of course, science is creative in the sense that you have to imagine, you have to imagine a possibility to formulate a hypothesis. You've got to imagine a possible, a possible world as a possible set of circumstances. And then you have to, having imagined it, you've got to design instruments to go and test it. This is the way science is supposed to work. And it starts with, um, it starts with imagination because you've got to start thinking about the possibilities. Then, and, then, and then design hardware and, and whatnot from there. Um, I do think the science of astrobiology, which is the, the science of searching for life in the universe, it also has, has produced a lot of um, creative thinking by forcing different scientific disciplines to work together. So you'll have a sense of it from, from, from this kind of subject I, I touched on. Um, but you're gonna search for life in the universe, then you need to know about geology, you need to know about biology, you need to know about astronomy, you need to know about chemistry. Uh, and so instead of, I mean, you, were, you at the beginning, you were, when you said that education, at least in the UK, it does cut deep compartmentalize people very early on. Uh, and this is probably quite, um, um, I mean, there have been some significant benefits over the last century or so of scientific specialization, of course, we've discovered a lot of things. But on the other hand, something's been lost. Um, you have all these scientists who are excellent physicists, but don't know any geology or excellent geology, but don't know enough chemistry or, or probably geology, you know, chemistry, but not maybe not astronomy. The thing about, the thing about, um, the thing about astrobiology as a discipline is it 
you, you can't escape. You can't stay in your little silo. You can't look for life in the universe just from one academic discipline. You have to be aware of uh, and have knowledge of all of these other ones. So I do think the, the science of astrobiology is very integrative of different sciences. And I think this is a, um, a, major, a major benefit of it. Yeah, and I think that's been one of the great kind of things that I've seen change more recently um, in trying to understand humans and how we fit within the natural world um, and what does it mean to think and have desires and beliefs. Um, and you can't just look at that from one perspective. So learning about the genetics behind it and um, the evolution behind it and the development behind it and the more angles you can come from the, the 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 more the the richer your story becomes um, and I think I find that bit really exciting so I'm constantly trying to learn different approaches and understand different ways to view it and sometimes that is the creative thing it's like step out of your own box and look at it from somebody else's different approach perspective um, and how does that influence the way I've been thinking about things prior to that and I've, I've found that a really really exciting experience um, so Cool. Um, I, I've, uh, I'm, I'm really so pleased to have had you both uh, available today to speak to everybody and be the first speakers for Science Saturdays. Um, we hope that we'll have more and more people join Science Saturdays as we go through the month of May. Um, and I'd love to just uh, tell everybody what's coming up in the coming weeks. Um, next Saturday, we've got two speakers from the Department of Biology. Um, at Birkbeck University of London. Um, and we're gonna be looking at the topic of the microcosm. So we've got two wonderful talks. Uh, one called Get On Board, which is about the public transport system inside of our own cells. And then we've got a second talk called A War in Vain, uh, which is about antibodies versus the viruses. Um, and I expect those to be very exciting talks as well. And we'll do a similar sort of um, talks and panel. And then in the weeks following that, we've got on the 15th of May, we've got a nature nurture theme, and we're going to be hearing about both our DNA, but also about pollutants in our lungs. Um, on the 22nd of May, our topic is mind the mind. So this is all uh, psychology based talks, and we're going to be looking at um, the biology and culture of psychiatric disorders. And we're also gonna be looking at uh, withstanding the storm, which is about making resilience work for you. In the final week, the 29th of May, our topic is becoming human. I'm gonna be giving one of your talks and this is gonna be about the two sides of our brain and how they've evolved to work with slightly different dominances and that impacts the way we behave in our natural world. And uh, my colleague, Natasha Kirkham, is going to be talking about how we develop from infants um, into a really chaotic and noisy environment. So she's got a talk titled Growing Up in the Middle of Everything. So I hope you will join us again each Saturday morning throughout this month for Science Saturday Talks. I hope you will like our, uh, our, our, our page here. Um, leave us any comments that you might have. We're always looking to improve public engagement um, and sharing science. Um, and again, this is a Me Human and National Saturday Club collaboration with Birkbeck University of London. Um, and we're trying to make science accessible to everybody. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for being with us today. We'll see you next week. Thank you to our speakers, Professor Ian Crawford and Dr. Phil Hoodley. Bye, everybody. Okay, thank you. Thanks.